Good morning, family. Um, Elder Sunday, uh, I was asked to speak about the lion and the lamb. Um, uh, I say the last couple of months, the elders have done a wonderful job of giving me more intriguing lesson topics, um, and sometimes I need more than one week to come up with where I'm going to go with that. So um, next time we gather together, that'll be the topic that we talk about, the, the idea of the lion and the lamb and and how Satan can be called the lion and Jesus can also be called the lion and what does that mean for us. But for this morning, uh, if you're following along, we're going to be primarily in Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to start with a, a discussion on being sons and heirs to the promise. Verse 1 reads, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we may receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now, if you recall, uh, last week we talked about the idea of, of us being a slave to one or the other, right? And, and, and we read about that in Revelation as well, that, that when we are called out of the slavery to sin, it doesn't mean that we're just simply free. We are either a slave to God or we're a slave to sin. So how do we relate that to what we're reading in Galatians chapter 4? Because it says that we're no longer a slave but a son. Well, if you look carefully at the text, when it says you are no longer a slave, we go back to previously, and it's referring to being a slave to the law. Right? And we know that the law is what, what, what condemns us. The violations of the law is what condemns us. We've talked about that for the last few weeks, right? If there was no law, there would be no condemnation. There would be no sin. But this idea of being sons is very important. It should be very important to us. Because sometimes we struggle to understand our relationship to God. God is our creator. He's our Lord. He's our king. He's our savior. He's, he's all of these different roles. And it can be really easy to pinpoint and focus on one role and that starts to define our life as a Christian. But just like any relationship, our relationship with God is very dynamic. It has layers. It has depth to it. And so on one layer, he's our master. On one layer, he's, he's our creator. He's our savior. He's our king, right? And on another layer, he's our father. But we, in our modern mindset, struggle to pair those two up. The idea of being uh, in complete submission to your father as a slave is to a master is kind of foreign to us in our, in our day and age. It's not something we often think about, and it's certainly not something that is regularly enforced in today's family. But... I want you to consider how uh, uh, an obedient, especially an obedient son, reacts to their father, right? If, if I have a healthy relationship with my father, I trust a few things. A, that he's looking out for my best interest. B, that he's never going to tell me to do things I shouldn't do or things that are detrimental to me. And ultimately, that he will protect me. That he'll stand up for me. And the interesting thing is, sometimes we have this discussion and we're, we're thinking of children and adult fathers and we fail to realize that that relationship never changes. How many of you, um, how many of you had a healthy relationship with your father as an adult? All right, good. Not an embarrassing question, right? 
Now I want you to think about that. Did your trust in your father change when you turned 18? Did you, when you became an adult, did you suddenly stop trusting that he was going to look out for you? Did you suddenly think that he wasn't going to protect you the best he can or provide for you if you absolutely needed it? No. That trust remains. That doesn't ever change. Why? Because you're still a son. He's still a father. The relationship never changes, even if some of the dynamic does. And with God, it's the same way. We're not called to remain children, not, not physically and certainly not spiritually. We just heard a verse read that refers to us as a royal priesthood. But no matter how advanced we get, no matter how much we grow, we still fall back on this trusting God to be God, to look out for us, to provide us, to protect us. Now, the wonderful thing about this is a slave can be sold off. You can be traded or given away, set free. A servant, same thing. Wake up one day, you're out of a job. What happens if you, if you have somebody that works for you that regularly fails at their job? Well, they stop having a job, right? Because ultimately, business is self-interested. And so if I have a worker that's failing me and not assisting me in my goals, then they're not going to work for me, right? It's not, it's not cruel. That's just how business will operate. That's how, that's how work works, right? God is, is different because we're not just workers. We're not just servants. We're not just slaves. We're sons. And that means that it doesn't matter how much you fail, you're still a son. It doesn't matter how short you fall of the goal, you still have an inheritance. God doesn't pass your inheritance on to the next person because you failed to meet your quota of lost souls that you've talked to. God doesn't remove you from his book of life because you were mean to too many people. I know I often focus on the importance of of repentance. I talk a lot about the um, crucial uh, point of no longer sinning as Christians. I know I focus on that a lot, but today I, I want to primarily focus on the even when. Even when we sin, even when we fall short, even when we're disobedient, even in our times where our belief is lacking and, and, and failing and falling behind, God has adopted us. Now, having grown up in the foster care system, I think that there's a, there's a beauty to this idea of adoption. Because this is, this is more than, well, he created us and so he cares about us. He also chose us. Isn't that interesting? And it happens when we have nothing to offer. It happens when we have no practical value from, from our human viewpoint. We can offer God nothing. We've done nothing for Him. He offers us adoption during a time when we've done nothing but reject Him. When we have failed to uphold His standard. When we are at our most disobedient, he offers us a place in his house. I think there's a wonderful beauty in that. The way that God is described to us is all-encompassing. When you, when you step back and look, every facet is covered. God creates us, and then we reject him, and then he adopts us anyways. So not only is God directly invested because we are, in a way, his fruit, but he then chooses us when we have made ourselves rotten, when we have proven ourselves unworthy of his vineyard. 
in a worldview where things are disposable and things are temporary and things are easily replaceable, there is solace to be taken in a God who valued us when we were valueless. There is a comfort to be had in having a relationship with a creator who took us in when we had nothing left to offer. There is a time when we live in our sin, when we are so thoroughly broken down, when we are so thoroughly used up, that there is nothing left in us that is good. Now, maybe you don't feel like that necessarily applies to you, but it definitely, definitely applies at least to how I felt about myself. And what that means is that if I have failed to, uh, if I have failed to cultivate any goodness in my life when I was under my own authority and my own rule, then that means that any goodness that now exists in my life exists solely because God, solely because He has placed it there solely because he's given me the ability and the knowledge to cultivate it. So this is is the next step of this sonship. Everything about us is directly related back to the Father. This has a huge amount of implications for us. It has implications as far as the permanency of our salvation, and it has implications as to our responsibility to God. Permanency, because as I said before, we don't have to worry about being cast out like a, like a um, valueless employee or a fruitless laborer or a rebellious worker. We don't have to be concerned with being replaced by the next best thing. But there is also a responsibility in it. A responsibility because if we are sons of the Father, then that means that we have an obligation to represent the Father. The great weight of inheritance is that we have a responsibility to reflect the image and intentions of the one providing us with inheritance. You see, we can't walk away from being holy or being good or being righteous without walking away from the inheritance because, and this is, this is the difficult and wonderful and complex thing about it, that is our inheritance. We so often look at this idea of an inheritance and it's, it's, it's repeated over and over and over again. I counted 14 different verses in the New Testament, they use the word, specifically the word inheritance. It's used over and over and over again, and we always think about it as being eternal life. We always think about it as being heaven, but what we sometimes fail to understand is that it's not just heaven. It's righteousness. It's holiness. It's goodness. Heaven is simply where these things come from. God is the one provides it. Heaven is simply the residency that we're offered. But holiness is also an inheritance. That's why it was only really offered to the Jews. Because they were the only ones called to be sons of God in the Old Testament. This is, this is why no matter how hard you tried under the Old Covenant, if you were a Gentile, you were always unworthy. Because you were not offered an inheritance. No matter how good a servant you became, no matter how obedient or faithful. But under the covenant offered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are all offered a place in the family. As we've talked about in the past, a covenant has always had some concept of adoption placed within it. When you enter into a covenant relationship with somebody, you're not entering into an agreement. You're entering into a familial-like bond. This is why you don't say, I have a business uh, a covenant with this person, right? It's a business agreement. It's not the same thing, right? When two men enter into a covenant with one another, they effectively consider themselves brothers. And there's always a sharing of blood that is placed within a covenant. 
because there is always this idea of adoption. And so this is why we take the Lord's Supper, why we symbolize the taking in of the blood of Christ and the body of Christ is because we are representing and reiterating and reinforcing this idea that we have been adopted through sacrifice. So what does it matter if we came from Abraham? What does it matter if we can draw a lineage to Jacob? Because we draw our lineage from someone who predates all of them, who holds a higher esteem and a higher place in the kingdom of God. We draw an inheritance and adoption as a son of God because our lineage comes directly through Jesus Christ. What a wonderful hope that this provides us with. And not just hope for one day, but a hope for right here and right now. It's so easy to look at all of the troubles of the world in despair. It's so easy to look at all of the people making bad decisions and and even so far as the people who identify as bad people and despair. As I've told uh, almost any team that has sat through a class with me, despair is the voice that says, this is how it is. Hope is the voice that says it doesn't have to be. Despair tells us that there's nothing to do, so there's no reason to do anything. Hope is the voice that reminds us that there is an end even to this. There's an end even to the darkness. There's an end even to the suffering. There is an end to the cruelty and the pain that is found in this world. And as a loved one once reminded us, reminded me, if they've got it wrong and you have the right answer, that leaves you only with the obligation to be present to provide the right answer. If we have the answers to eternal life, and the world is struggling with goodness, and we know where goodness comes from, then we are all the more responsible for projecting and showing goodness to the world. Not because we can force it on them, not because we think that we're going to change people, but so that we can remind them that they always have a choice. There is never a point in this life where repentance is not offered. There is never a line drawn by God that tells us we can't come back from this. This is the idea of being a city on a hill, a lamp that is shining a light to other people. It's it's not that we're going to draw everybody, right? People are people. They're not moths. They're not going to come just because you're brighter than they are, right? But by shining a light, people can see what's offered in front of them. We shine a light onto the path of righteousness by being righteous. And in doing so, we light that path up for the people who are not on it. We're not going to convert people. The idea that I can somehow talk you into the acceptance of Jesus is, is a ridiculous idea. Why would you respect me enough to accept it just because I say so? I don't accept what I say because I say so. Right? But I can show you that there's options. I can show you that there's a different way. And man, if we get tired, if we find ourselves tired of showing that to people, then what hope is left? Where does your joy come from, if not that? We stand against the darkness. It doesn't mean that you fight against every evil known to man. It doesn't mean that you're involved in every situation that's possible. We stand against the darkness by showing people that you don't have to be in the darkness. We stand against the darkness not by stopping it, 
but by showing people that there's a way out of it. We don't force our views on people. We don't, we don't force our beliefs on people. If you don't want to believe in God, that's on you. That's between you and God. It, has, it doesn't actually change a whole lot of how I'm supposed to interact with you, right? My relationship with God is between me and God. That I'll share it with you so that you too can know that you have that option. But ultimately, God tells us two things. We're to, we're to speak truth and we're to love one another. And man, if I tell you the truth and you don't want to accept it, I still, that doesn't do away with the other obligation, does it? If I want to tell you all about God and how you need to change your life and you say, no, thank you, I'm still obligated to love you. It doesn't change anything. And we don't do that because we were seeking some kind of outcome. That's not, how, that's not how godliness works. That's not how holiness works. We, we don't do what is righteous because we hope for good things to happen as a result. We do what is righteous because it becomes who we are. Because not doing what is righteous stops being an option when we find our identity in Christ. When you are sons of the Father, representing the Father becomes your character. It's not something you do for a result. It's not something you do because you think you're going to get some earthly reward. In fact, having had plenty of different circumstances and opportunities in life, I, I would argue that if you're doing anything with the hope of an earthly reward, you are vast majority, the vast majority of the time, you're going to end up disappointed. You're going to end up disappointed because you're not going to receive it. You're going to be end up disappointed because it's not what you thought it was going to be. We do these things. We do these good things because that's who God is. And our inheritance is that he allows us to be those kind of people. Your inheritance isn't something you look forward to. Your inheritance is already given to you. It was given to you the moment that you submitted yourself to God and submitted yourself to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was given to you the minute you submitted, submerged your person into the waters of baptism and were gifted with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. At that moment, you became something different, someone different. No longer a slave to law, no longer a slave to sin, no longer a slave to the consequences of your once bad decision-making paradigm, but a son of the Father, someone who has promised goodness and holiness and life eternal. So I urge you this morning... If it's not something you enjoy currently to pursue that, don't leave here today unsure of where you stand with God. If you have not done so, submit yourself to the process of repentance. It's not about giving something up. It's about gaining something better. It's not about becoming more disciplined. It's, be it's about becoming better to be given hope so that we can act better and make better decisions, to be given a purpose so that we're no longer buffeted around by the winds of change, by societal standards, but we stand firm through the years of eternity on a relationship that far, far predates us. If you have not already, I encourage you to join in this great inheritance, to join the heritage that is Christianity, that is the family of God, to find your place within a kingdom built to last. And if you are, if you do identify already as a son or child of God, then I encourage you to reevaluate what your relationship is. It's not about enforcing 
or forcing. It's not about converting. It's about reflecting who God is. And goodness will always present itself. Goodness is never done in the shadows. Stand against the darkness of the world. No one's asking you to be some outspoken activist. Although if you want to, go for it. No one's asking you to make some vast change in your life and to move overseas as a missionary. Although if you want to, absolutely. Only that we be a people who stand against the darkness of ignorance and despair by shining a light of wisdom and healing and goodness. Make plain the path of righteousness so that others may have the option of joining us. There are some that will stand condemned in the end of days because we make that offer known to them and they reject it. But how many more will accept what was done for them? will accept the identity offered to them. How many more people will shine their lights out brighter after seeing our own? So I encourage you today, make right your relationship with God and understand that this is about more than just doing the right thing because you think good things are going to happen. This is about more than doing the right thing because we're afraid that we'll somehow lose our salvation. Understand, I'm not preaching a once saved, always saved doctrine here. I'm simply presenting that there needs to be more. That cannot be the concern for why we're doing good things. We do good things because it's who we are because it's who God allows us to be. If you have need this morning of reconciliation, whether it's to people or whether it's to the Father himself through the waters of baptism, whether you're asking for prayers from your fellow saints, whatever your needs are this morning, we ask that you bring those needs forward and make them known so we can help you see them met as we stand and sing.